Yeah, and globally, it looks like capital is being shifted out of Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Why, is, why are those areas becoming a bit unattractive right now to investors? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, again, from a from a real estate perspective, I mean, there are various headwinds, which I think, you know, all markets have, have faced. Um, but on a relative basis, you know, Asia Pacific offers a real growth opportunity, both from an economic point of view, from a growth point of view, but also just in terms of asset class point of view. There's still, you know, emerging asset classes in real estate that, um, that investors are increasingly finding attractive to enter into from an early stage. And for example, that might be the build to rent sector in Australia, or the fact that Japan already has a very strong multifamily um, real estate asset class to invest in. And I think all those different fundamentals, and, and obviously where various countries are at in terms of their interest rate environment, inflationary environment, but I think what's really been seen is not only is the, the strength of, uh, of equity sitting in the Asia-Pacific region, but also just the huge amount of opportunity to, to seek return um, and long-term investment as well. Yeah, looking specifically at the Australian market with real estate, a um, lot of capital obviously flowing in. What are some of the really popular sectors that investors are looking at? Is, is apartments a growth sector still right now? Yeah, I mean, Edward, we, we've seen, I think, in this uh, since the beginning of 23, 39% of all overseas capital that's been deployed into Australia has gone into the living sector of, of some sort. And I think, you know, we can really break that down. I think, you know, for sure, apartments, there's always a strong, you know, demand from overseas investors, more to, at a private level, perhaps for those individual apartments. But from an institutional investor base and, and a lot of the clients that we work with, I think we're really seeing that shift in terms of wanting to get into that broad living sector. But I think arguably for Australia, that really means the build to rent market, um, which again is you know very much about building stock into a, an, an institutional grade residential investment sector and following you know the trend that America's had for maybe 30 years, the UK's had for the last five and, and many parts of Europe as well. Um, but I think we also can't underestimate the strength of the education system in Australia and particularly for, uh, for, for Asian capital, so regional capital with an APAC, you know, who often seek to have that English language university education in Australia. Again, we're seeing huge demand from that thematic uh, in terms of, of what we call PBSA, but, but purpose built student housing accommodation. Yeah, Australia's population grew almost 2% last year, which is pretty strong compared to a lot of other OECD economies. Is that something that's really helping boost investment in the country? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when you're looking at the global sort of population environment at the moment in terms of most countries entering into an ageing population, population decline, but there's a few pockets, you know, where there genuinely is, you know, population growth through organic measures, but certainly through immigration as well. And I think, you know, when we when we look at some of those dynamics and perhaps Canada is another example, but Australia is absolutely at the at the forefront of that from a from a population dynamic. And I think, you know, when we're speaking to institutional investors around the world, but certainly in, in the Asia region as well, I think when they're looking at those thematics of, you know, where can you get a long term investment, what makes sense? You know, population growth generally means you need real estate. And that means across the board, whether more office space, more housing, more retail, more logistics. So, it's, again, I think, you know, from that point of view, that's where we're seeing a you know demand from foreign capital coming into Australia. But it is very much against those thematics you mentioned. Yeah, and just looking at those other sectors, corporate office, um, industrial warehousing, and then as well, retail spaces, out of those, which one is holding up the best still? Yeah, look, it's a great question, Edward. And I, and I think, look, different investors have got different strategies and at different points in their own investment cycle. So I think what we're seeing is there's real opportunity in all those sectors, and particularly whether that's from an office sector moving to more of an ESG or green compliant asset base from an occupier and an investor point of view. But I think, you know, it, it would be hard not to highlight just the strength of the Australian logistics market. Um, you know, our, our teams across Australia have had a very strong uh, first half in this year as, as a transactional sector. Um, we've seen over half a billion dollars deployed just in the first in the in the last quarter we've had in Q3. Um, and that's on top of the one point five billion already transacted since the beginning of 2023. Um, and I think where you see real depth in that sector as we're moving into Q4, you know, there's another $2 billion worth of logistics assets either on the market or, or perhaps moving towards a, a transaction as well. So, I mean, certainly strengthen logistics. And, and I say that's capital that's coming into Australia, not only domestically uh, from the strength of your, your domestic investors, but again, thematically from a lot of institutional investors who are, who are pivoting to an Asia Pacific strategy and very much starting in Australia with, with a uh, logistics strategy as well. Well, Chris Brilgram from Colliers, thanks so much for coming on the show. Edward, thanks very much for having me.